Hi guys. So basically, this is a story about a house I lived in a year ago near my IT campus in the west of Ireland, which I believe was haunted. To begin, before living there, I was always pretty skeptical of haunted houses, and for good reason. As a teenager, we would often visit haunted houses in our locality, which never really proved to be so, at least while we were present there. A few days after moving into our new college house for our final year of college, me and my friends went out to do shopping and get food. Upon arriving back, we noticed someone had left the oven on. We each denied it, but we knew someone had to have left it on. Looking back, this was probably the first unexplained incident as thinking about it. Nobody had even put food in the oven. Over the following few weeks, we started to notice odd things happening. Creaks, groans and movements from the side of our eyes. At this point, two of the housemates were convinced of a haunting. However, myself and another were still not convinced. It was soon only me that was left unconvinced, as one day, while the other non-believer was home doing study, they looked up to see a face peering at them before vanishing. It finally clicked for me when I woke up one night, just before Christmas, to see a very large man, or what I believed to be a man, staring at me from my wardrobe. Then things started to get really strange. Boot prints started to appear on the ceiling, making tracks across the roof by the year's end. One of my friend's girlfriends swore she saw him upstairs in the room when he'd been downstairs with me all along. Our shower, for which there were three switches needed to turn it on, would come on in the middle of the night, and one room off the kitchen would send shivers down our spines any time we went in there. There was one night in particular which really scared me. I always locked my door before going to bed and distinctly remember doing this that night. When I awoke in the night, I could see the large man again, this time at the end of my bed. I shut my eyes, telling myself it was a dream and went back to sleep. The next morning, my door was wide open. So were all the doors in my wardrobe, and the guys had told me it sounded like I was dragging my school bag from one end of the room to the other all night. So this has happened twice. I suffer from anxiety and get really bad adrenaline dumps. So that paired with hypochondria, I'm almost always feeling weird. It's been like this since I was nine and I'm 36 now, so I've gotten used to talking myself down. Unfortunately, when something really messed up, I tend to either ignore it, or if it's too bad, pop a clonopin or two and ride it out. About eight years ago, I did that. I was feeling super dizzy and kind of sick, but during a panic attack, I always felt super dizzy and kind of sick. So I just did the thing and laid down with a movie on. About 10 minutes later, I smelled my grandpa. My grandpa had a very distinctive smell, like sandalwood and something else that was just him. And I heard him say, turn off the stove. Like, in my head? He had passed like three months or so before, so I thought maybe it was from a sweater of his. But you don't ignore your grandpa, dead or not. So I checked the stove, the gas was on. I lived with two smokers, turned it off, aired the house out. The second time wasn't very long ago, maybe a month or so. I'm diabetic but not insulin dependent, but my sugar still tends to run high, so I don't generally worry about it getting too low. And again, the whole anxiety thing. Anyways, I wasn't feeling very good, so went to bed kind of early, and had a dream where I was in the house I grew up in. The entire house was dark, and I was standing in the dining room, watching the kitchen, which was bright and a bunch of people were wandering about, which was pretty normal as our house was kind of the family hub and where everyone went when they needed a place to go. My stepdad and my aunt were sitting in their usual places. My aunt eating pizza, she loved pizza like Ninja Turtles level loved. And I wanted to go into the kitchen so bad. Because I mean like, holy crap, that's home. My aunt gestured to a pizza box and I was just about to walk in when my stepdad looked over and was like, poke your finger. My arm looked kind of sad and then I woke up, went to check my blood sugar and it was like 50, which isn't deadly, but it's pretty damn low when you run like 130 most of the time.
It all started when I was 12 years old. I can't remember how it came to this, but one day, me and a couple of my younger friends were walking out from our block of flats, and I saw something with a corner of my eye. I don't know what it was. It was standing in the corner. It was tall, and though I only saw it for a brief second, I experienced literal existential fear and pushed myself and my buddies outside as quickly as possible, them not understanding what just happened. We discussed the situation a little, speculated about what was up, but it still wasn't a big thing. We just went on with our day, doing whatever kids are usually doing. It would be fine if it ended with that, but it didn't. After that, the three of us started seeing things. All right, maybe two of us, because the other one is a known liar. And I'm not here to tell lies. And I know for sure some of you will consider me a liar. It wasn't anything clear, but you would just walk home in the evening and suddenly see someone dark and tall standing behind a tree. You knew something was there and it was watching you, but you would think that maybe your mind is messing with you. Soon enough, it went surreal. All I can say is we were all became pretty paranoid, feeling like being watched all the time. But naturally, being kids, we also became really curious. That's when we became hunting this stuff. And I'm not kidding, we called ourselves hunters because we would walk all over our area late in the evening, inspecting every dark corner, seeking out the paranormal. I know for sure that most of the experiences were just scared kids' imagination especially considering the fact we would bring in someone new who didn't experience this stuff previously in order to scare them. This was a kind of bait for whatever haunted us because we hoped it was drawn to fear. But two encounters stand out as very real. Stuff like I saw it standing next to my bed when I woke up at night for a couple of seconds and it pushed my back when we were on a hunt but when I turned around no one was there and even it started loudly chanting something in my ear, even though nobody was there. Won't be included, although it happened. I can't remember most of the smaller stuff anyways. For God's sake, I'm 20 now. The first one occurred when I got us two walkie-talkies, so we could split into two teams and inspect the area more efficiently. Oh yeah, look at those little shits thinking they're SCP Foundation stuff. This time, however, we were hanging out in our yard and playing with only one of them. The other one was right there with us, turned off. That's when someone else appeared on our us unusual frequency. We heard strange noises and I started repeatedly asking who was the third one on the line. For some time it was dead silent, but then someone finally said, they're calling for you. Nothing more, silence. This is pretty scary on its own. The strange things is, in five minutes, all three of us were called home almost simultaneously. Me and one guy got calls from our parents. The other one was approached by his father directly. And that's when we got paranoid over one more thing. Maybe our parents are under the influence of what we thought to be a demon as well. I know we probably were overthinking and it was just a coincidence, but come on. When you're scared, you can't really think straight. The second one was worse to say the least. This time, there were two of us, and I swear to God I would think I'm hallucinating if I was on my own. We were heading to our usual place of hunting, a dark street between a block of flats. Please mind that I'm from Ukraine, and it's not some fancy building, but a Soviet nine-story panel one, wildly overgrown with trees, and an old semi-abandoned factory. It's not clear if it's in use or not, but once in an eternity, we could see its pipe steaming though everything around it is covered in metal scrap and trash. Our casual talk was interrupted when I suddenly stopped to stare into the bushes. My friend joined me, and now we both stared at something we couldn't exactly understand. It was something white floating at around three meters height. Not see-through like a ghost, but solid white. It almost seemed like we were hypnotized because I don't remember any thoughts coming through my head. I wasn't trying to process what I saw, just looking. And then it frowned. I don't even know how to describe how exactly it frowned while having no distinct features. It felt like its skin, if you can even call it that, wrinkled in a way to express anger. It took us a couple more seconds of stupor before I woke up from it, punched my friend in the shoulder 
and we ran somewhere people could see us as quickly as we could. Nobody was around though, so the best option was to say somewhere someone would possibly notice us from a window. I was quietly hysterically laughing from all the adrenaline. I felt like I finally saw something unimaginable and we almost just died at the same time. Things about it now though, this thing would probably end us if it could or wanted. And I know it will sound unbelievable, but we went back. Yeah, yeah, nobody would do that. That's bullshit, all this stuff. I was just curious if it had a body. Here's the thing. It was so dark, I couldn't distinguish anything below its supposed head. So we grabbed some rocks and sticks and went back. It was still there. Though a little bit closer to the path we were standing on this time. It wasn't moving, just like us for a moment, because it was freaking terrifying to do what was planned. We didn't know what we were dealing with. We were just impulsive, stupid kids. But we still threw whatever we grabbed at him, barely reaching the bushes at all. It still reacted by stretching its damn neck, skin tightening on its tendons or whatever they're called, and it felt like there were way more of them than it should be. At this point, our fright reached its peak, and we finally ran away. The demonical nonsense went on for some time, a couple of years I'd say, but at some point everything just ended. I don't know how, I don't know why. Maybe because we got older and we were not as sensitive to the paranormal stuff, or because we were getting more and more brave, bringing kitchen knives and crosses and all that stuff to try and protect ourselves. But maybe this thing just got bored of us and went on. I know that I saw it. Maybe almost everything that we thought happened was just our imagination. But those two instances were real as heck. I would die to know what that thing was and what it wanted from us. It made a couple of years of my life feel like an absolute mess. It would be nice to sort those memories out, to understand the hell we were dealing with, because sometimes it feels like I'm just an idiot who can't get over the games we played as kids. With nobody con to consult with, I prefer not to mention this part of my life to anyone, because I know it sounds like fiction. Sometimes I hope I see this tall bastard again, just so I know he's real. I also should tell you my parents built the house my experience happened in. So no one died there. But the village I live in got burned down in the past and witches got burned. Also, there's a vortex slash pause in the bathroom mirrors facing each other. What I'm about to tell you happened 16 years ago when I was 10, but I still remember everything crystal clear as if it just had happened. As I said, I was 10 and always had the feeling of being watched and followed in the dark. Well, it was a bit more specific, but I'll talk about it again soon. I always calmed myself by telling me it would be nothing. Every kid is scared of something silly like that, right? At least I thought. Even though I didn't like the dark, I wouldn't say I was scared. I rather proved myself wrong by facing whatever thought it is making me uncomfortable. So again, when there was a dark area around me or if the lights were completely off, I often had very specific thoughts that tried to scare me. Like something is in there watching me reading my book or something just waits till it's dark to grab me and scratch my arm right here. Like it was very specific. What would happen in the dark, you know? When I was a kid, I loved documentary movies, so I knew about survival instincts and stuff. That's when I would tell myself to calm down. It's natural to be scared of the dark because we can't see. It's nothing there. To prove it to me, I would do exactly what my instincts told me not to do. Most likely nothing happened, as I told myself, but the next day, I had scratches and blue marks on my body where my instincts told me it would be if it was dark. I ignored it. I think I just didn't want it to be anything since it would mean there really is something. That was just to explain the background a bit. Let's talk about the night that changed my life. As I went to bed, I again had this feeling. This is a really, really bad feeling. It was way stronger than before. Something told me to not switch the light off. To explain, I was already in bed. I just had to reach out to hit the light switch. But before I could turn it off, I freezed and just 
couldn't do it. My thoughts weren't specific this time. I just had this huge fear of doing it and it was just like, you'll regret it. It took me a few minutes to convince myself I was childish and just should do it. Eventually, I turned it off. It was dark around me, like really dark. I had those glow in the dark stars on my wall, but I couldn't even see them. It was just pitch black. Again, this huge fear overcame me and I slept deeper under my blanket. Everything just felt off. That's when I heard it. A very creepy breathing right behind me in the room. I was facing the wall, eyes wide open. Again, I freezed. I was too scared to turn around or move myself. Jeez, I was even too scared to breathe myself. I just hoped it wouldn't notice me. I can try to describe the breathing sound. It was almost as it would growl in a very, very, very deep tone every time it breathed out. While breathing in, it sounded like it was kind of buzzing at the same time. I can't tell how long I was just laying there, listening to the sound of its breathing. It felt like forever. But considering I didn't breathe the whole time, it can't be that long. Suddenly, I heard the sound of something being moved through the air. How do I explain? Do you know the sound when you take your ruler and just move it in the air real quick? It almost sounds like the wind in the trees, but different. Maybe you know what I mean. After I heard that sound, something hit my face. Well, more like brushed over it. I had long black hair back then, and I felt it being moved forward with the force of it. And then silence. All I could hear was my own heartbeats. I still couldn't move. Not because I was paralyzed or something. It was more like I didn't want to move because I didn't know if it still was there and if it would attack me if it found me. I think it was pretty aware of me being there the whole time, but back then I didn't know that. Everything would have been possible, you know? When my body forced me to breathe again, I was freaked out by the sound of my own breath at first. I thought it would be back. It took me a while to figure it was just me and everything else was still silent, but I still just lay there listening. This time, I can't tell how long it took me, but I didn't move until I noticed my stars on my wall growing again. I reached out and turned the lights back on. I was shaking so badly. I remember how I couldn't hit the switch at first because I kept missing it because of this damn shaking. With the lights back on, I realized this really happened because it was proof right there in front of me. I had a teddy bear on my writing pulled on the other side of the room. Now remember the sound of something moving in the air and how something slid over my face? Well, there he was, my teddy bear laying between me and the wall his eyes facing directly towards mine. Something threw him at me. I'm still living in the same house and I'm convinced whatever it was is still here. Over the years, I figured there are several ghosts in this house and most of them are friendly. But there also is the really evil entity. Well, I'm not sure if it's just this one or even more. Most of the time it's in my old childhood bedroom, so I avoid going up there. My family and I tried to get rid of it several times but every time there was something that crushed our plans. And so it's still there. This is not at all the scariest thing I encountered, but it was the first one that made me realize that there are paranormal things and I kind of grew up with them. My story starts off a couple months before I was born. My mother told me that my dad was into demons and thought that doing a ritual on my mother and myself would make us luckier. I don't know much about what was used except skulls, candles and a wired liquid my dad put on my mother's stomach. Nothing much happened after that with my family except when I was two years old, I was crying and pointing at a corner as my family asked what was wrong. Growing up with my little brother, that's not regular behavior for a two year old. All I can remember about that was a big spider with the face of an old white man. I addressed the color because my dad didn't really like white people all that much. This memory is a weird one because I remember it through a different person's perspective. Fast forward a few years and I'm around five or six and my entire family, even people I don't talk to, 
Now we're at my grandparents' house for about seven hours. And me as a kid, I wasn't paying much attention and just playing around until my grandma told us all to gather around the table. She was just talking about how she and all the women in the family were having dreams about losing something important like money or family. In all their dreams, it would be an old white man who's taking it from them. At the time, I didn't care because I was bored. But the thing I remembered so clearly was my grandma saying that her family was cursed. When I was seven years old, I moved into a new house and I've had the worst experiences in my life at this house. One of them was when I was sleeping on my couch and I woke up and I couldn't breathe for a good couple minutes. And I was just there screaming for help. Another one where I seen a pair of shoes in my house that were too big to fit anyone, but I was a kid and didn't care. But as I was sleeping and I woke up at around 7.30, I saw an outline of a man looking at me. And the last one when I see a headless thing run into my sister's room. Four years later, we moved into our last house and this house wasn't the scariest or the worst. Just a lot of stuff happened there. The third month, my grandma died, which broke my family apart like bad. About a year in the house, I had a weird experience with my brother and it was summer and around 3 a.m. And I was laying down when I heard sounds coming from my brother's 19 years old bed. And when I look at his bed, I seen him looking down at something. And when I looked down at what he was looking at, I saw him sleeping that scared me. So I just went to sleep. I told him what happened and he just said he had a bad dream. I have some more, but I think that's for another time. But when I was 12, I had sleep paralysis and I seen that spider with the man's face. And I also seen my grandma, but nothing about her was her. And she just had a big smile on her face, but it didn't look human. I also saw people I didn't recognize as well, but they looked the same as well. I always joked about dad doing voodoo, but he confirmed it a couple of months ago. And a day after he told me that I watched a video of someone having sleep paralysis and seeing that spider with a man's face. I've always wanted to share this story. At the time it happened, I did tell my flatmates, but I left out certain details, not wanting to seem like a weirdo to them. I've had a handful of strange experiences throughout my life, but most have been far more subtle than what I'm about to tell you. This happened sometime between 2012 to 2014. I would have been in my late 20s at the time, living in a shared house in the eastern suburbs of Sydney. I worked nights packing shelves at a supermarket, a job I absolutely hated but had kept all through uni. In fact, I'd actually graduated in early 2012 but found I was too lazy to just quit. I ended up spending those last few years in the share house kicking around, working this crappy dead-end job, waiting for everyone to go their separate ways so my life could start. After each shift, I'd catch the bus home from work at around 11pm get off at the top of the hill at the shops, then walk down the hill towards home. It was only about a 10 minute walk home from the bus stop and I only mention all these details because I probably caught that bus and made that same walk a thousand times in all the years I held that job. This was the only time anything even remotely creepy happened. I topped off the bus and was headed downhill with the cemetery on my left and a row of simple one and two story homes on my right. I almost never saw any people at this time of night, that's how quiet the area was. The road is also well lit, and despite a cemetery looming over your shoulder, there's nothing eerie about it. In fact, it's quite a beautiful, well-tended cemetery, filled with interesting old markers, statues and things. You'd see people jogging or walking through it most days. The cemetery is bordered by a sandstone wall that follows the way downhill, then left along this coastal road that sort of loops back around. I was maybe halfway down the hill when a plain white van drove past on my left. At first, I thought nothing of it. I didn't break pace and the van didn't stop or slow as it went past. I watched the tail lights go small, sweeping left as it looked, took to the bend at the bottom of the hill. But as soon as it disappeared, I had this very odd feeling come over me that I was going to see it again. 
I'm not sure how else to describe that. It wasn't like a voice in my head or anything, just an odd fleeting impression that when I got to the bottom of the hill, the same white van would be waiting for me. So I got to the bottom, turned left, and saw a pair of headlights coming back towards me. They were too far to see if it was the same car, but immediately I knew it was. I didn't feel scared or anything, but I knew then that whatever was about to happen was going to happen, whether I wanted it to or not. Again, just a fleeting impression. This time, the van slowed and came to a stop at the side of the road. There was a young guy driving. I can't remember whether the passenger side window was already open or whether he leaned over to open it. But either way, he leaned across and called to me to come over. All I thought in that moment was, he probably needs directions. But as I approached, I immediately began to feel very uneasy. The gentle impression I'd felt earlier, watching the van drive past, now solidified into a vague feeling of dread. I felt as if I shouldn't get too close, so I came about as far as the grassy verge and then stopped. I remember the radio in the car was playing, just some random pop song. He might have reached over and turned it down, I can't remember. I also don't remember too much of what he looked like, to be honest, except that he was maybe about my age or a little older, had longish blonde hair and a few days of growth on his face. He didn't strike me as threatening, so the unease I felt was more confusing at first. He spoke with a British accent, so I just assumed he was a traveller. Excuse me, he said. Can you help me? I'm trying to get to the cemetery. Do you know where I can find the cemetery? I was really confused. Just over his shoulder, on his right, less than 20 feet away, the tops of grave markers and crypts poked above the sandstone wall. Like I said, the way was well lit and he would have definitely seen the cemetery as he drove this road a moment before. In fact, he'd driven down to the far end of it, then made a U-turn, and that's when I'd seen him coming back. At the other end, where the road loops around the coast, the wall wasn't high, and you could clearly see all the graves, even in the dark, stretching back up the hill. It made no sense. I was just about to answer, when my blood absolutely ran cold. I froze mid-word, my mouth hanging open. Somewhere in the back of a van, I could clearly hear a woman screaming, crying for help. I could even hear her banging against the inside panelling. I heard it clear as day over the radio playing. I knew it wasn't a recording, but it was also somehow strange and seemed slightly unreal to me. Again, not too sure how to explain it. I definitely heard it, and it scared the hell out of me but I didn't react the way I thought I would. I looked at him, and he just stared back and said nothing, making no effort to explain the screams, or even acknowledged we were hearing them. But there was no mistaking it. I could still hear it clearly as we started to stare at each other. Sorry, I have no idea, was all I could get out. He nodded, said thanks anyway, and drove off. I ran the rest of the way home, which thankfully was only two minutes away. When I got in, I was out of breath and shaking. My flatmates were all asleep and I went straight to my room. If there had been even 1% of doubt in my mind, like maybe I'd imagined it, I would have probably woken someone first and at least told them what happened. Instead, I called the police. I had to explain the story to two different cops. Long story short, because of a jurisdictional thing. My area actually fell under a police station further away than the local one I'd called. They took it seriously, took all my details and said they'd send a car to look for this van. Unfortunately, I hadn't seen the license plate number. In the moment, I hadn't even thought to check, stupidly. And my description of the driver wasn't much more detailed than what I've described here now. Though they had my details, the police never called back to follow up, and nothing showed up in the news or any newspapers. When I told my flatmates about it, I left out the strange feelings of dread and just stuck to the details. They mostly thought I'd been pranked somehow. And while I guess that's possible, to this day, I know that not what happened. It's one of those had to be there things, but the whole thing felt so unusual and didn't play out like any kind of prank. The whole thing lasted not even three minutes from when we first drove past 
to when he drove off. And this reaction lasted probably even 20 seconds. But it stayed with me for years, and I often think about it, wondering what happened. I thought about it a lot over the years, and my gut tells me that there was something else going on. What I mean by this is, I don't actually believe there was anyone screaming for help in the back of the van that night, but I 100% swear on my life that what I heard was a woman screaming and crying for help, and that it was coming from back to the van. I actually don't think the driver could hear it either, but what that means, I really don't know. Anyways, that's my story. Like I said, I've got a few others, but this one is the most dramatic and I suspect it will stay with me the rest of my life. So, I go to a relatively old college, built in the 1800s, and there's a bunch of stories of it being haunted, but I don't really buy into it that much. I've been here a couple of years already and haven't seen anything too weird. Minus what I'm about to say, which is possibly the weirdest thing that's ever happened to me. My roommate is never here. She always just stays at home and commutes to school for classes, which means I basically live alone in my dorm. As an introvert, I couldn't be happier. After dinner, I usually just go back to my room, lock the door and work on homework. So a few nights ago, I was at my desk working on my paper in the dark and listening to music on my phone. All of a sudden, the music stopped and my laptop switched off on its own. Neither the computer nor my phone would turn back on, like something had just disabled all the electricity in the room. At that point, I just kind of accepted my fate and decided that would be a good stopping point for homework. It was probably after midnight anyway, and the next day was a Saturday, so I didn't need to use my phone to set an alarm. I decided I'd probably just go to bed and let both devices charge. Less than a minute after everything shut off, there was a knock at my door. I remember walking to the door and going to look through the peephole. But after that, I remember nothing. I woke up in my bed the next morning on top of the sheets, which I never do, and I didn't even remember going to bed. On top of that, when I checked the door, it was unlocked. I never leave it unlocked, even when I'm in the room. I'll check the door three times an hour out of paranoia, just to make sure I didn't forget to lock it. I've even turned around halfway to class to see if I remember to lock the door. I figured it must have been my roommate who came to the room that night, and I was just so tired I don't remember. So I texted her to tell her she'd forgotten to lock the door last night, but she responded by saying that she was never at the apartment. I thought she was lying or something, but then she FaceTimed me. She was in a completely different state. The only two people I would have opened the door for were her and campus security, and I have no idea why security would have been at my door past midnight, especially since I was making zero noise, and no one else has a key, so I would have had to have been the one to unlock the door. Nothing in my apartment was out of place or missing. I finally assumed that I must have dreamed the whole thing, and that I'd somehow unlocked the door in my sleep. My phone and laptop were working fine, after all, and showed no signs of damage. A couple of days later, though, I started telling my friend in class what had happened. And as soon as I mentioned that my electronics stopped working, some other girl that I didn't even know butted in and asked, was there a knock on your door after? The girl proceeded to match my story almost exactly. She was alone in her room, all the electricity shut off, there was a knock on her door. She went to check through the peephole, and she remembers nothing after that. Her only difference is that she woke up on the floor next to her bed and not on top of her bed. She says she also knows someone that this happened to, but she won't tell me who. I'm just thinking that if there's three of us, this may have happened to a lot more people that we don't know about. Has anyone experienced anything similar? Is there anything I should do about this? I don't think campus security would do anything about it since nothing was stolen. I wasn't hurt or anything, and there aren't even any cameras in the building. Great security plan, I know. They barely even do anything about actual crime, so I'm pretty sure I'd get laughed at if I said anything. What was this, and what do I do? My best friend died in 2017. I still don't know if it was suicide or an overdose, but yeah. He left our world when he was 18 years old, but it felt like he never left my side. 
His presence was almost more intense than when he was alive, especially in my dreams. I won't go into details, but thanks to him, I found my passion again. After his death, my dreams changed drastically. The location in my dreams was always the same, a very abstract but peaceful place. Sometimes I was alone, sometimes he was with me, and sometimes there were many beings. We were both beings too, genderless, pure and almost childlike. We both met when we were 14 and 15 years old, so I don't know much about his childhood. The theme of my dreams was always adventurous. I felt love, sadness, anger, happiness, fear, and all these feelings in the most intense way. I was one with everything. I really wish I could explain my dreams better. I wish I could show you all what I saw in these dreams and what they taught me, but I just can't find the words for it, not even in my native language. As I mentioned before, I found my passion for art again. He loved my artistic side. He even told me shortly before he died that he really wanted to see me creating art, that he would buy me a piano. That was a joke, but in a loving way. I really wanted to learn the piano at the time. He visited me in my dreams for about one or two years and it suddenly stopped. I never dreamed of that place or beings again. My dreams were never the same again. And I think my cat did the same. My cat also died suddenly in 2021. His death was too painful to bear. I felt like I was about to go crazy. I wanted to die with him. He didn't visit me that often in my dreams, but one dream struck with me. He told me over and over again that I need to stay alive, that I'm strong, that I have to fight. His voice was almost like an angel. It sounded neither masculine nor feminine. He looked me intensely in the eyes while he spoke to me, and since then, I truly believe that he was our angel all along. He protected me from myself. He showed me what it means to be strong, in his lifetime and in my dreams. He taught me to be kind to myself and to others. He taught us what it means to be a family. A few months after his death, our whole house smelled like him. It was such a strong smell, as if he was right next to us. My family had these experiences too. Dreams, his scent and his presence. I don't know if I'm just imagining things, but even if it was just in my imagination, it helped me. I found my purpose, and as much as I want to die, as weak as I feel sometimes, I feel blessed for these experiences. It puts a smile on my face when I read my dream diary. So when I was little, the very first house I lived in as a baby was this old 18th century townhouse that my parents rented from the local doctor. Suffice to say, that place was super haunted. It's a story for another day, but three years ago, they finally sealed the upper floors off entirely, and the doctor told my mum that nobody will ever set foot up there again. The bottom floor is now the GP office and waiting room. Now, all of this aside, Growing up in that environment left me with a major sensitivity to spirits that's kind of still active sometimes. I'm 25 now. But when I was a kid, I terrified my entire extended family with the things I would come out with at random. Anyway, one of the more popular stories my parents tell at barbecues and parties, and just to anyone who will listen, happened when I was two, and mum wanted to pop in to visit her grandfather's grave. Her family are from a village about 20 minutes drive away, and there are two graveyards, the new one and the old one. My grandfather is buried in the old one in the old family plot. This graveyard has since been locked, and you have to get a key from the priest to get in. So, being two, I wasn't overly interested in sitting down by a graveside to pray with my parents, and they were happy enough to let me wander, so long I stayed in their sight. And luckily for them, I didn't go far. I bottled down the path, and stopped about halfway back among the tombstones, where I started to sort of sway on the spot and dance as much as a two-year-old is capable of. My parents watched me for a few minutes, but didn't think much of it, and then told me we were leaving. My dad picked me up, and we headed for the gate, but just before we left, I turned over his shoulder, looked around, and smiled and weighed at something. They obviously didn't really think it was anything to be concerned about, because a week later they went back, my grandfather had died the day before their wedding four years earlier, and mum had been very close to him, so they visited fairly often. This time, when we went in, I didn't even wait for permission and ran back down to the same graveside, 
where I began swaying on the spot again, looking up over the grave of the air as if something was suspended there. It's probably worth describing the grave, but there isn't much to describe. It was a very small patch of earth that didn't even have a border, fairly overgrown and with a totally rusted small iron cross at the head of it. There was no nameplates, no indication of who was buried there, and it clearly wasn't a recent grave. Keep in mind, literally nobody is buried in the cemetery anymore, except a couple more of my family members who went into the family plot. At this point, my parents are creeped out. My dad, who swears blind that he doesn't believe in ghosts and never will, came down to ask what I was doing, and I explained that I was dancing. He asked me why, and I pointed above the iron cross, and in the jumbled English of a toddler said, The boy is singing, and he wants me to dance. My dad picked me up ran past my mother and got in the car to wait for mum. They went to my great-grandmother's house across the street and told her the whole story, but they all agreed it sounded a bit ridiculous the more they thought about it, and since I was only two, it was probably just a game. So they went back. They entered through different gates. They went over the wall, no matter what they did to try to confuse two-year-old me, I always went back to the same grave. And once again, there was nothing special about it. It wasn't beautiful or impressive. There was no reason for a two-year-old to be so drawn to this little patch of earth. But I always went straight there. I always danced while he sang to me. And I always waved to him before I left. Regardless of which side we left from. Or which winding pathway they took out of the place. They brought other family members with them as witnesses. They had family friends question me about it. I always told the same story. My earliest memory is of my grandmother sitting me down on the cemetery wall while I was trying to dance as instructed, while my parents looked at me, totally scared, and asked me to describe him or tell her what his name is. I don't think I answered her, but I remember finding the looks on their faces just so unbelievably funny, because they were so scared of my friend who only wanted to sing to me. What I didn't know was that my great-grandmother had told the priest, brought him in there to show him the grave, and asked if there was any way to know who was buried in the little unmarked plot. He went off and checked the burial records, and sure enough, five-year-old Robert, the blacksmith's son, had died of TB almost a century earlier and lay there, marked only by the little iron cross that his father made for him. Funnily enough, my great-grandmother knew the blacksmith. He was their next-door neighbour, but he was an old man when she was a little girl, so she never knew the little boy. My parents stopped bringing me to see my friend after that. We only went into the cemetery for funerals. We also moved out of the doctor's house, but it was a few years before I stopped being a creepy little kid that terrified anyone that spoke to me. I actually did go back a couple of years ago and brought a friend of mine visiting Europe from Boston. She told me when we met that she could speak to ghosts and after a couple of weeks I started divulging the hundreds of stories I have from childhood. And she asked if she could come to the cemetery with me. Since the gate was locked, we had to hop the wall once. We were inside. She pointed clean across the top of the headstone and said, Hey, is it over there? Pointing at its location. I nodded, and she started walking towards it and stopped right at the Iron Cross. This one? I nodded. I swear this is totally real. She stood there for a second and then started backing away. I didn't have to ask why. It was the middle of December, and yet the air seemed to fizzle and get really, really hot. The hair on the back of my neck stood on end, and the pressure that built up in my head made it feel like my scalp would split open. She told me she wanted to leave, but I was already running out of there, and we vaulted the wall like Olympians. I don't know what happened that day, since I'm not a child anymore and didn't really see anything. But I couldn't shake the feeling that afterwards, that my little friend there felt like I had brought her with me so I could impress her and he didn't like that. Not at all. I don't actually remember any of this to be clear because I was a baby, but I've been in the house several times since and my parents and others have told the story so many times that I may as well have experienced it. Basically, I grew up in a late 18th century townhouse, or part of it anyway. The building itself was a doctor's surgery or GP's office, and it was a family home that had been around for generations. 
my parents rented the top two floors and part of the ground floor. If there were rumours before they moved in, they certainly hadn't heard them. And for the most part, the house was okay. Things really only amped up when I was born. It was an old house. The furniture was all antique. There were portraits on the walls, antique silverware in the basements. There were just three bedrooms despite its size. And the master bedroom was enormous with high Georgian ceilings and clearly old wallpaper and moulding. It was a beautiful room and they tried to stay in it. But after the first night, it became apparent that it wasn't going to be possible. It was freezing for one thing, and even with the heating on and the fire lit in the room, it was just unbearably cold. Not great for a newborn. So they moved to the back bedroom instead, but the master continued to give them the creeps, and they sealed it up, somewhat unsuccessfully. If you closed the door, it popped open again. If you closed the door and locked it, then it would be open again by the next morning. Always the same amount, just about three inches. Only a crack, really. If you closed the door, locked it and piled furniture in front of it, then the banging from inside would keep the baby, me, awake all night. They convinced themselves that the banging was the result of birds nesting in the chimney, rather than something more insidious. But at least it always stopped if you opened the door again. Keep in mind that this is a large, heavy oak Georgian door, with an antique handle that has to be turned to open. They decided that based on the cold of the room, it was clearly a draft which was opening the door, closing it every time they went past, just to feel proactive and move on with their lives. Then I reached the age where I moved out of my parents' room, and into my own room next door with a baby monitor on at all times, to make sure all was well. And it was, except for the other voices that came through it. Whenever I was put to bed, by the time they came downstairs, they'd hear me babbling away on the baby monitor, and slightly more troublingly, a deeper adult voice babbling back. They checked, of course, and whenever they'd open the door, I'd be laughing and reaching for someone above me, but promptly stop and look at them. Pretty soon, they realised there was basically nothing they could do, so they just ignored the babbling and kept an ear open for anything more worrying. My mother tried to convince herself that it was probably interference with another baby monitor on the streets. The noises sure did freak everybody else out a bit, though. My uncle once babysat me when he was just 14, and my parents returned home to find him sitting on the front step, shivering and clutching the baby monitor, me babbling away, crackling through the speaker. Good to know his policy was to abandon me to the ghosts, but it was fine. They didn't ask him back, and he told me years later there was no money they could ever have offered him to make him come back anyway. Sometimes when they themselves went to bed, things would get a little rowdier. There was an outhouse down the back of the yard, and sometimes at night the light would flick on down there at night. Not willing to take the risk that it could be rowdy teenagers or burglars, my dad would invariably haul himself out of bed and go to check it out. And invariably, as soon as he left the building, the clattering and banging in various rooms would start. I don't know why it wanted my dad out of the house to do so, but my mother used to the house by now, would just roll her eyes and wait for him to come back. One morning, they were awakened by banging so loud from the attic, the objects on the bedside locker were vibrating, and my mom was certain that the roof was going to cave in. My dad jumped up, grabbed a flashlight and went to check it out. He came down ten minutes later when the banging came to an end, and told my mother that a bird had gotten in through a loose slate and he managed to get it out. Years later, after they left, he admitted that there was no bird. He just stood up there, terrified, surrounded by knocking and banging that was almost deafening, and then all of a sudden, it just stopped. Things really ramped up when my parents decided to go looking for a new place to live. Tired of renting, they decided to start saving for a deposit, which was perfect, because a woman connected to the house by family ties was really keen to move in and was just about to get married. To her, this big old house was a dream first home. One day, my dad came back from work to find the whole stairs and the walls covered in what he assumed was honey. Annoyed, he blamed the babysitter and asked her not to put honey on my pacifier in case she rotted my teeth. She denied even having any honey on her and my dad let it slide. But the walls and stairs were sticky for weeks despite frequent cleaning. The banging got worse too. More birds in the attic, he assured my mother. 
The lady who was due to move in after we left started sending painters in, and she was dead set on making that grandmaster bedroom into her own room. The painters came three times. The first time they painted the walls and ceiling, left it to dry, etc. And when they came back, next day, not only was the paint still wet, it was sloughing off the walls in places like an ill-fitting skin. So they shrugged. It was a cold room and scraped the paint off to start again. They opened the windows for air. That room always smelled like turned earth, my dad says, because of the damp and cold. Lit a fire in the grate and tried again. Next day, they return. Same thing. Paint just refusing to stick to the walls. They were annoyed this time, starting the job once again. But by the time lunchtime came, they popped their heads into the kitchen, told my mum they'd be back later, and took off unusually quickly. They never came back. They left their paints, brushes, painted clothes, even their radio behind. Dad met them a few days later and asked if they were going to come pick them up. And they waved him off. Don't worry about it. Another painter can take the job. Dad said he asked if they'd seen something. And they went quiet for a second before laughing nervously and heading off in the van. Eventually we moved out and left the house behind. My dad once met the previous tenants in a restaurant and they sheepishly asked how he had liked the house, admitting that they could never even walk past the house anymore. My parents didn't mind it much, but when I asked them if they'd ever go in there again, they hesitated. The tenant after us was my dentist growing up, and at one appointment, she gently asked my mother if she had ever seen anything weird, to which my mother laughed and asked what she had seen. The dentist was the owner's sister, and she told my mom that she had lasted just three months before she left in the night, one day with her new husband, and handed the keys back to her brother. There was never another tenant. Furthermore, the upper floors have now been boarded up and the stairs removed. Nobody, my dentist said, will ever go upstairs in that house again. The weirdest incident happened after we left, but as none of the three of us were there, we always opted to take it with a pinch of salt. The way she told it to my mother, weird things were happening for weeks after they moved. But it, like my parents, they pretended it wasn't going on. One day though, they could hear trickling water, even though there was no rain outside. Obviously in an old house, this is less than ideal. So they started looking for the source. Their search led them to the basement. The basement always scared my dad. A lifelong skeptic, more than any other area of the house and they didn't tend to go down there pretty much ever, so that was fine. It was larger than the footprint of the actual house and contained a vaulted ceiling kitchen and laundry, as well as the servants' quarters and rooms piled high with antiques. At best guess, it's older than the house itself by at least a century and belongs to an earlier building on the site. Anyway, when they opened the door to the basement, they were met with the sight of water running down the back wall as if the ceiling had split and was allowing a river to run in through the house. Obviously they panicked, called a plumber immediately and waited for him to arrive. When he did, they brought him down, but it had been a half hour by now. The three of them stood at the foot of the stairs and when they opened the door, six inches of water stayed standing, according to the dentist anyway, at least three or four seconds. Just enough for it to look totally wrong, but not long enough for anyone to say anything before it rushed over their feet. Well, flooding like this required the fire department to vacuum it out, so they ran upstairs, feet sopping wet, and called for help. When the fire department arrived, they traipsed back down, dreaded finding out how much water had built up by now, with everything in the room being so valuable, opened the door, and nothing. The room was dry, there was no water, and there was a layer of dust over everything, just as there had always been. The dentist thought she was going mad apparently, and the fire department weren't especially impressed with being called out on a joke. Obviously, as my parents never saw anything like this, so they're not sure of what to make of it. But you never know. Details about the history of that part of town could well point to something that weird happening. Whatever was in that house was clearly a poltergeist, but at the same point, it didn't exactly seem to mean any of us any harm. It just liked babies. It's got the house all to itself now with just the doctor's surgery operating on the ground floor. I hope it's much happier now.
Since I was young, I've been told I can see spirits. I moved around a couple of times while growing up here, and each house had a spirit or more in them. When I used to live in an apartment at six to eight years old, I remember waking up in the middle of the night and seeing two white yellowish figures at my doorway. I rubbed my eyes to see if I was tripping, but I really did see them and saw them move. One was tall, the other was short. I didn't feel scared, but in disbelief, especially when they started dancing for me. My dad has always been a skeptic, and still is, but apparently we drove past a cemetery one time, and I was too scared to look because I said, I don't want to see no white people, ghosts, and he told my mom that. Another time, still the same age, we moved into a house by a forest, and I saw a huge brown figure pass me at the corner of my eye, and I legit thought it was a bear inside that house. I chased after it, but it was gone. Then my aunt's house caught on fire. Her first son passed away in 2000. My mom decided to take me to the burnt house. When I walked through the doorway, I immediately felt pressure or a force pushing me. My mom felt it too. My instinct was to go upstairs to my cousin's room. I went inside and I felt sorrow, even though I had never been in this room, nor was I attached to it. The room also felt cold. I found myself in tears and I didn't know why I was crying. But maybe it was my cousin's spirit's feelings. Maybe he was sad his home got burned down. I remember seeing photos of the house right after it got burned down. I saw orbs in the pictures and handprints on the walls with long fingers. I asked my aunt for the photos, but she doesn't know where they are. My aunt's friend was also a medium and told her the house was a bad spirit or his bad luck. I don't remember which, and that she would sell it but she never sold it after many years. Years later in middle high school, I moved to this townhouse. I lived there until I turned about 21. This house has always made me feel uneasy. I'd hear creaking of the floors upstairs like someone is walking. I thought it was just the house being old, but it was built in 1981. There were a couple of times my dog would stare up at the staircase and growl at it. I remember her first sticking up. After that, she would sit by me like she's scared because she was shaking. My mom also had left food out purposefully for spirits. She even cursed her co-worker to death. I'm not sure if it's even related to the house. I used to pray every night because I knew I felt scared all the time when it got dark. I think that house was the only house I truly felt scared every night or whenever it's dark. But one time, I was praying... I felt someone's breath on my left ear and heard a male voice whispering in a different language. It felt sinister. I was so scared I froze. I told my dad, but he didn't really believe me. We then moved to Arlington by the courthouse in a newly built apartment. I never felt or heard spirits since then, and I was never scared. More time passed, and I decided to move to my aunt's house, which was rebuilt on the same ground. I remember seeing a white figure pass me. It literally looked like someone in a white t-shirt went into my room. I tried to follow it, but it was gone. Another time I was eating with my aunt at the dining table. We were just talking, and I looked up and saw a black figure above her head. I froze because I felt scared, but then it disappeared after two or three seconds. It was weird, because I saw it clear as day. A few years ago, my mom went on a solo road trip. She doesn't usually like to travel alone, but I was in college and she wanted to visit some family a few states over. The trip went well, up until the last night on her drive back home. She had booked a room in a and b that looked really nice online, but everything went off the rails when she actually arrived, which I witnessed since I was on the phone, FaceTime, and being informed with texts and photos from her almost the entire night. When she pulled up to the house, it was totally dark. There were no lights on inside, and it seemed almost deserted. When she called the B&B to say that she'd arrived, she was told to take a key from under the doormat and unlock the door herself, as the innkeeper had been caught away in an emergency, and she would be the only one there for the night. She was already a bit uncomfortable with the situation, but went inside anyway, since she had already paid the fee and didn't have anywhere else to stay. The interior was old-timey looking, with velvet drapes, thick, dusty carpets, 
shelves full of photos and trinkets, and weirdest of all, many decorative plates with babies and children painted on them all over the walls. My mom locked the door behind her and went upstairs quite quickly, since she was feeling scared. Upstairs was worse, though, with the continued vintage furnishings and the unfortunate addition of about 15 ceramic dolls in each room, arranged on the beds and propped up on the tables and shelves. At this point, my mom was really freaked out, but kept trying to convince herself that there wasn't actually anything scary about the inn, all the dolls or anything else there. So she picked a room and started trying to go to bed. She did find herself turning the dolls around in her room so they faced the wall, even though she's usually a stark disbeliever in anything paranormal. That's when everything got really strange. She started hearing sounds all over the house, very human-like sounds. It started with creaking, then footsteps and whispering. My mom was overtaken with fear in a way she'd never experienced before. She found herself frozen in place, where she quite literally couldn't move, while hearing more and more activity. The sounds eventually escalated to screaming, crashing and banging sounds from all over the house. After a few minutes, my mom managed to shake herself from the paralysation and realised that she needed to get out as fast as she could. She was so terrified that she actually tried climbing out of the window on the second storey. But the roof below was too steep and she had to climb back inside. Then she took a fireplace poker, since she said she didn't know if the noise was from some robbers or something, gathered up her stuff and ran into the hallway and down the stairs. She was quite shocked to see that everything was exactly as it was when she came in. Except for one thing. A single one of the baby plates had fallen from the wall and shattered on the floor. There were no people in the house. The door wasn't bashed in. All the furniture was in the same dusty spots as before. She booked it from the door, threw it open, dropped the house key somewhere in the front yard and drove away. She had never been more afraid in her entire life and had never been less sure in her opinion that ghosts were fake. She drove around the town for a while and ended up in a Motel 6, where she probably slept about 45 minutes, then came home. Unfortunately for her though, that isn't where the story ends. She had been looking forward to arriving home so that she could be finally done with the whole frightening occurrence, maybe get some sleep, and watch some reality TV that had been recorded while she was gone. What she didn't account for was the ghostly hitchhiker that seemed to follow her back. That first night home, she fell asleep on the couch with the TV on. Around 2am, the TV turned off on its own, and she woke up suddenly to hear loud footsteps running through the living room. She lives totally alone in a standalone house. Weird things continued to happen for about two or three months, including a constant problem with the TV turning on or off, changing volume, changing the channel by itself. She would hear voices, screams and footsteps throughout the house and would often wake up to have items in the kitchen and living room moved around, very weirdly, with no explanation. The most notable of which was when the toaster has mysteriously moved to the top of the fridge one night. Fortunately, my mom really dedicated herself to 100% ignoring the ghost and trying to avoid feeding negative or scared energy into it. And after a few months, it went away. She felt like she knew for sure that it was a ghost and that it latched onto her that night in the inn. She certainly isn't much of a skeptic anymore.